Welcome to Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out with Julie Caraccio. Every Tuesday at 1 p.m., Julie interviews experts on all areas of clutter, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Learn easy-to-implement tips on how to release clutter and get organized to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire. An award-winning professional organizer and coach, Julie also shares suggestions to help you live clutter-free for a more joyful and fulfilling life. Are you looking for information on how to get organized and reduce clutter? Have you wanted to hire a professional organizer, but it's not in your budget? Do you just need some quick professional advice on clutter or organization? Our clutter-free living classes and how to organize your life office hours support you in becoming free, moving forward, and achieving success. Learn more at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. Hey everyone, we're opening up the archives today. I did this interview with Peter Walsh back in 2011 when I had an international internet TV show called Reawaken Your Brilliance. Peter is my favorite organizer and I was honored and thrilled when he agreed to be interviewed. This is by far my most popular video on YouTube and it's generated a lot of positive comments and there's lots of great information from Peter and I wanted to share this with you. So sit back and enjoy. Why do we have so much clutter? Why do we need so many storage solutions? How does having clutter in your life prevent you from living your best life possible? What is relationship clutter? Can clutter be mental? We're going to talk about that more tonight. If you're not familiar with Peter Walsh, he is known as the decluttering and organization guy. He was born and raised in Australia. He's one of seven kids, middle child, three brothers and three sisters. The idea of working with kids was always attractive to him, so he got his teaching degree and taught high school math, science, and graphic art. His background in education led him to work in drug abuse prevention and health promotion in Australia and then in developing health, education, and training programs for schools and corporations. In 1994, he came to the U.S. and launched a company that produced workplace training programs that helped employees with their interpersonal and communication skills. All these experiences came together when his training experience and interest in organizational change in the workplace and in homes caught the attention of the producers of the hit TLC show, Clean Sweep. He did more than 120 episodes and helped thousands of people getting excited about decluttering and organizing their homes and lives. Helping people live rich and full lives without drowning in their stuff continues to be the focus of most of his work. He's a best-selling author. His first and favorite is It's All Too Much, an easy plan for living a richer life with less stuff. Peter lives in Los Angeles with his partner. No pets, no plants, no clutter. Welcome, Peter. Well, that's quite a wind up. <laughs> well, thank <All> right. <laughs> you. I'm thrilled to have you. And I just have to, to say something before we start the show. I had the pleasure of meeting you in Los Angeles next year or last year, and you couldn't have been nicer and more down to earth. And so I just have to say thank you for that. And um, you have a wonderful reputation among the professional organizers of being kind and generous. So I had to pass well, that along. Well, that's very sweet of you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a, it's, it's, it's a very big sandbox, and there's a ton of room for all of us to play. That's my philosophy. I'm 110% with you on that. So let's get started. Why do you think we all have so much stuff? Well, I mean, for, for me, it comes back to the fact that we're caught, you know, we're social beings, and we're caught into this whole mindset, whether we like it or not, that, that more is better. You know, this idea that if one is good, two must be great. And, and the second thing is we, we're caught into the idea that, that we, we show our success. We display, um, we display I guess, um, how, how, not how good we are, but we display how well off we are by a show of what we own. You know, you, you, get, a, you get a pay rise, you get a larger car, you know. Um, and, and so, so much of who we are and what we project is strangely tied to what we own. And, and I think we then get caught very much into what I call the product and the promise. We start mm -hmm. to buy things believing that if we just buy the right stuff, we'll be able to acquire the life that we want. And so we buy things expecting that they will deliver on a promise 
skinny jeans will make us more attractive. Mm-hmm. Beautiful cookware will make us better chefs. You know, makeup will make us look more attractive and sexy. You know, a slick car will make us seem, you know, more successful. And often what happens is we end up with a home full of products and, you know, lives still, those, those promises still not fulfilled in our lives. So, you know, it's just this interesting interplay between who we are and what we own. And I think we're all kind of caught into that to some extent. Absolutely. So what would you say to someone who's struggling with that, being like, okay, the jeans that are going to make me skinnier, the makeup that's going to like, make me look more attractive, what do you say when yeah, yeah. working with someone? Well, well, for me, it's interesting. You know, when it comes to stuff, when it comes to getting organized, the biggest mistake that people make, and this will sound really weird, really counterintuitive, is that people focus on the stuff. And these issues that we all deal with have nothing to do with the stuff in the first instance. The place we all need to start is to ask ourselves, what's the vision we have for the life we want? What do you want from your life? Not what do you need for your life, but what do you want from your life? What do you want from your home? What do you want from this room? What do you want from your job? What do you want from your relationship? And then ask, will this item, if I bring it into my home, will it help me create the home that I want? If I enter into this relationship, will it create the life I want? If I, if I acquire these objects, will they help me create the space that I want? And if they do, then go for it. But if the stuff you own doesn't help you create the life you want, my question is, why do you own it in the first place? Outstanding. Now that brings up a question. Um, I've read, I believe, everything that you've written, but one of the favorite, <laughs> I do, I, I love you, Peter. They actually, my friends don't even tease me about it anymore because they know that it's just, just so sincere. I admire you tremendously. But one of the things I was really excited, and I can't remember which book it was in, you talked about relationship clutter. And, uh-huh. and you know, a lot of times people aren't going to bring that up in terms of getting rid of clutter and organization. So can you talk a little bit about what relationship clutter is, and if maybe someone's struggling in that area, what advice you'd have? Look, look it's, it's, it's interesting that, that when we use the word clutter, we think so much about that stuff that we trip over in our mm-hmm. home, the boxes of stuff in the garage, the kids' toys, the papers on our desk. But for me, clutter is anything, anything at all that gets between you and the life you want to be living, anything at all. And so if, for example you're in a relationship and you find that you keep getting angry over the same things, that that when your partner says something to you, you respond in a knee-jerk way that that maybe is not very thoughtful, Um, that, that when you're in a social situation, you behave in a certain way that you wish that you didn't, that style of communicating, that, that way of behaving, that way you conduct yourself, all of those things are clutter. Because if something is getting between you and the life you want, you and the relationship you want, whether it's a way you think, a way you speak, the way you conduct yourself, then for me, that is clutter as well. And just as, just as real as the, you know, the crap that's filling your garage, then you need to get rid of that. You need to get that clutter out of your life, whether it's physical or social or emotional or relationship clutter, if you want to get closer to the life that you want. It's, it's, it's all much the same. It just, you know, just clutter mm-hmm. takes different forms. I've never had clutter. I'm pretty organized as a person. And for me, I found that was the biggest area where I needed to improve. And that was setting boundaries and, and letting go of people in my life who, who were clutter, who weren't making me happy and were bringing me down. And that, for me, made the, made the biggest difference in my life. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting that, that you know, we, we all wish to be kind of, you know, very polite, you know, rational, reasonable human beings. I think it's something we all strive for. But but for me, if someone in your life is, is being toxic, if someone in your life is disrespecting you, if someone in your life 
constantly fails to to meet commitments that they make to you, then in my in my way of thinking, that's no different than the toxic clutter that fills your home. And you know, you have a choice of either welcoming those people into your life, to go back to my original point, do these people, do these relationships help you create the life you want? And if they don't, then I would ask, why are they in your life? And I think it's perfectly reasonable and in fact absolutely necessary that if you have relationship clutter or emotional clutter or people clutter in your life, then they may well come a time when for your own health and well-being and, and nurturing of your soul, you need to jettison them. Get rid of them. If they're cluttering your life and causing you pain and angst, get rid of them. It is, and you'll feel so much better when they're gone. Guarantee it. Speaking from, speaking from experience. <laughs> Now, Peter, one of the, when I first saw you speak when I lived in California. I lived in Pasadena, and I saw you before Clean Sweep and everything, and I had an aha moment, and I find a lot of people really struggle with this. I saw you speak, and you were talking about how we, a lot of times, infuse memories onto objects. And so after hearing you speak, I went home. My grandmother had died. I was extremely close with her, and my aunts and father were great. They wanted to make sure everyone in the family had something. Well, I've got this beautiful bedroom set, which was hers as a little girl, and it's antique. It's 100 years old. Well, I also had these plates, which were probably from 1950, that she got when she opened up a bank account that were free. And at one point, they were white, and they were but now gray and dingy. You had little daisies around them. And I was like, oh, they're my grandmother's. I can't let them go. I heard you speak. I was able to let go of all that kind of junk that didn't and keep the quality thing. So I'd like you to address that for people who are struggling with letting go of things that have memories. Yeah, you know, it's it's something, you know, I deal with a great deal and I could talk about for a very long time, but it comes back to the idea that <clears throat> pardon me, that things have power. And when it comes to what I call memory clutter, and that's the stuff that reminds you of an important person or achievement or event from the past. The fear usually is that if you let go of the object, you will lose the memory. And, and there's nothing wrong with me remembering the past, but if that stuff takes over your life, takes over your home, fills your space, and stresses you out and creates guilt in your life, then my feeling is that no one who truly loved you would ever want to put you into that situation. And so for me, it comes down to it, it's important to, instead of trying to hold on to everything, just stop and quietly think about what are the treasures that that person whose memory you want to hold on to would want to have left you with? What are the things that when you look at most make your heart sing with the memory of that person past. And in your case, it's this beautiful bedroom set. And so when you look at that, you feel so happy and excited and it brings a smile to your face. The plates, not so much. So the trick is to find the treasures and to display them with honor and respect in your home, not under dust in the garage or in a plastic bag in the cupboard in the spare bedroom so that every time you look at them, the memory that they evoke is one of joy and pleasure of that past person or event or achievement. And, and I think that's the trick. Find the treasures, display them with honor and respect so that it brings joy rather than stress into your life. I love that. I think that's so true. And I want to remind our listeners, if you have a question for Peter, you can chat it. Or call in at 919-518-9773 or Skype at Computers 2K Voice. Peter? Yes, sir. Uh, are you wearing a headset? Um, I'm not. So you're just on a phone? I am. Okay. Never mind. That was Amnon, our producer. So, Peter, we have a couple questions here on chat. I'm just going to throw it into one. If you have any suggestions when you were talking earlier about relationship clutter, people who are struggling with relationships in their lives. Do you have any advice for people on how to uh, mend, perhaps, or let go of relationships that aren't working? Um, you know, it's, 
I mean, it's. I mean, this this could be the subject of an encyclopedia. Look, for, for me, it comes back to really stepping back from your relationship and asking, as I said before, about your home. What do you want from a relationship? And that may be trust, honesty, monogamy, um, you know, intellectual stimulation. You know, make a list. Just sit quietly and make a list of what it is you want from a relationship. And then look, and whether that's a romantic relationship or a platonic relationship or a friendship, and then measure your friends or your partner or those close to you against those lists and measure yourself against that list as well because I really believe you can't get what you're incapable of giving. And so measure yourself against that list and see if you're found wanting. And if you are, then step up to the plate where that's necessary. And if someone, you know, if you're in a relationship with someone and there they don't meet those criteria for you, they're not giving you what you want from a relationship, sit down and have an honest conversation with them about that. That's the scariest part. But open a conversation because otherwise you'll end up wasting days or weeks or years of your life in a relationship with a person that can never be fulfilling. I think that's so true. And I also believe that we always have a choice and doing nothing is a choice if you, you know, choose to do that. But I think sometimes people are like, Oh, I don't have a choice. I have to stay in this job because it's a bad economy. Well, you do have a choice. And so I'm a firm yeah. believer of that and accepting of that and, and moving forward. Yeah. It's, it, the, the thing is it's, Look, I don't disagree with that, but often it's not that simple. You know, that, that, you know there are women, you know, there are many women in, in relationships that may not be as loving or as caring or as fulfilling as they would want, but maybe they feel they don't have skills. Maybe they, you know, in an area where jobs are tough to find. Maybe there are no family or support network nearby. Maybe they have young kids. And so you need to be careful in the first instance not to make it an all or nothing. You know, and, and I, I'm a huge believer that if someone in the case of a relationship has come into a relationship, at some stage there has been a spark of attraction and commitment and love and wanting to be there. So at very least have the courage to open the discussion with your partner and especially if you're a woman, you need to first say to a guy, you know, I'm, I, I'd really like to talk about our relationship. I'm not thinking of running out. I'm not thinking of bailing. I just want to talk about our relationship because immediately a woman says that to a guy. Guys have extremely small brains and immediately <laughs> panic whenever a woman says anything like that. So <laughs> open, open a discussion in a in a collaborative, caring way, at least in the first instance, before you completely bail. You know, and I, I think there's, there's kind of, there's, there's, I'm always careful not to be interpreted as being all or nothing. So start where you can, and hopefully both of you can work to a place where the relationship is fulfilling and you get what you want from that, that time together. I think that's excellent advice, and I agree. I don't, uh, probably that did sound all or nothing. I guess my larger point is it's it's taking a step. It's doing something. If you sit Absolutely. for days and weeks and years, and I've known people in that situation who have done nothing. You know, if you want to get out of a relationship, then start looking at careers or find out what's available in your community. I mean, I've always believed there's something yeah. proactive that you can do. Look, totally, totally agree. Look, change is tough. You know, change is tough, whether it's, you know, a house or a job or a relationship or you know, you know, a new set of clothes, you know, change, change is tough. And so, you know, everyone needs support and courage and encouragement to, to kind of engage that. So let's talk a little bit about how clutter affects our mental state, because a lot of times, again, you mentioned earlier, people think of it clutter as something that we might trip over. How does that affect us mentally? Look, it's, for, for me, it's such an easy thing to illustrate, Julie. Um, 
imagine, you know, and I, I really encourage your listeners to do this. Imagine when you go on vacation and you step into a hotel room. You open the door to the hotel room, especially if it's, you know, an upmarket, you know, maybe luxury hotel. You step into that space, clean lines. Everything is, is open and in its place. Nothing is touched. Everything is lined up beautifully. The sense you have is one of relaxation and calm and just, oh, this is such a nice place to be. And I think that's exactly what organization does for you. That's what lack of clutter does for you. It gives you a sense of peace and calm and openness versus that feeling when you walk into your family room and there are toys from from one end to the other or you step into the garage and you haven't been able to park the car in there for, for God knows how long or you look at your desk and it's covered in paperwork or your kitchen counter, you know, when you look at that and the sense you have is one of stress. And that's what clutter does. When we talk about clutter, we say, I felt buried in that room. I feel suffocated. There's so much stuff. I can't breathe in my home. And that's what clutter does, suffocates, buries, overwhelms us. And the, the fact is that we know inside of us by using those words that clutter somehow robs us of peace and calm and tranquility and focus. And, and if you think about it, it robs us also socially because we're embarrassed to have people over. It robs us psychologically because it stresses us. It, it robs us relationship-wise because we fight. I mean, you can just go on and on and list that clutter robs us of so much stuff and just messes with our heads. Now, we have a comment on chat here, Peter, from Audio, who says, I've resisted the temptation to feed the addiction by getting a storage room, but now my living space is suffocating. You have any thoughts? So they, they, they have they have both a crowded house and a storage unit. Is that what the? Yes. The, well, the, he's um, resisted the temptation to feed his addiction by getting a storage room. So now he's suffocating oh, in his okay. living space. Look, here's the thing: the if if let me draw an analogy. If you're in a relationship with a person and you don't honor and respect that person, or, or worse still, that person doesn't honor and respect you, that relationship sours very quickly. We've all been in that situation. It is exactly the same with your space. If you overload your space, if you fill it to beyond capacity with stuff, if you don't honor and respect the physical limits of your space, you can never have a good relationship with the place where you live. You simply can't have a good relationship with it. It will make you feel stressed and overwhelmed. So the first thing you need to do, and, and congratulations for, for fighting the urge to, to, to get a storage unit because it will just drain your money and out of sight is out of mind. You have to today stop bringing new things into the space and start today spending 15 minutes removing stuff from the space. And a very simple trick to do this is 15 minutes a day, two trash bags, run around the house filling one with trash and filling one with stuff that you can donate to Goodwill. If you do that for one week, at the end of the week you will have seven bags of trash and seven bags of stuff for goodwill, 14 trash bags in a week. That's where you start. Excellent. Well, Audio, let us know if you have any other comments or questions. And I want to remind everyone, if you want to chat a question for Peter, I will ask it. Or you can call in at 919-518-9773 or Skype computers, 2K Voice. So, you know, you talk a lot about, um, and I've seen your show, and how do... What do you say to people who are struggling with trying to find out what's important in life? <laughs> wow. I, I know that's one. an hour-long question, but maybe you could. Um, 
you know, for me, and I keep going back, for me, I keep going back to that fundamental question. What do you want from your life? It's a question that so few people ask themselves. What do you want from your life? You know, and I, I can make it, I can make it way more way more specific if I were to use the example of someone's room but with someone's life you know we should play this game you tell me you tell me Julie what are three things that you want from your life uh, we so seldom think about this oh well I know right off the top of my head well I want a relationship and I've just started okay. one he's awesome okay. but uh -huh. um, at this show I want to make this show my livelihood okay. and then um, I want to travel Okay, then. More. So that's there are three great things you want from your life. Then I would say for someone looking for what's important in their life, I would say, okay, get three large sheets of paper or three pages in a notebook and head one relationship, head one um, career, and head one you know lifestyle or travel, and then break. So you've got three broad categories. Okay, so what do you want from from that, your life of travel. You know, I want to see four continents. I want to, you know, I want to take one overseas trip a year. I want to whatever from a relationship. You know, we went through that earlier. I want someone who's respectful and honest and challenging and funny from career. You know, within, within a year, I want to be heard by X number of listeners. I want to have X number of sponsorships. And suddenly... From just by asking the question, what do you want from your life? You can start actually plotting out a very serious and specific plan for travel. I will save X dollars a week in, and put it into a travel fund. And at January of each year, I will plan a trip that I will take in September. Career-wise, I will send out 20 sponsorship requests to corporations to sponsor my show every month um, relationship wise I you know and then you start making a whole lot of very specific activities and goals to help you realistically achieve what's meaningful to you and what you want from your life but it all starts with that one question what do you want from and then you fill in the blank. I also had to look realistically. I think that's outstanding advice. And I'm going to go home and write 20 sponsorship letters tonight. But <laughs> okay. um, I found that I said, oh, I want to be in a relationship. But when I looked at how I spent my time, I wasn't devoting much time to that. And so I was like, okay, you're not going to meet someone sitting at home and so my big New Year's resolution for this year was just to have more fun in life, to go out there and enjoy myself, and I ended up meeting someone. But I think a lot of times people say, oh, I want this, but when they look at the time they spend doing things, it doesn't reflect that. Well, you know, and it comes back to, there are a couple of things there that I think are really valuable. Number one, you have to be realistic. And I think one of the greatest um, for me, one of the greatest kind of smacks in the side of the head about this is watching those early season shows of American Idol, <laughs> where people come in and audition, can't sing for crackers, can't, you know, couldn't hold a tune if their life depended on it, and are shocked when they're told by the judges, sometimes politely, sometimes not, that you know they're rejected, and the look of shock on their face. And it's like, who in your life has let you constantly get away mm. with unreal expectations? You know, I'm all for encouraging people to strive, but you have to have realistic expectations, have dreams. But there has to be some element of reality. And I think that's really, you know, that's really critical. And then secondly, you know, start setting achievable goals. That, that really then start, you know, the start being measures of success for you. Know, you know, small steps. And if you start achieving, you know, some small goals, it really builds confidence. You know, for, your own, for yourself, you know, going out, it's much easier to stay home and bemoan the fact you can't meet someone 
than, you know, the scary thing of going out and stepping into a social atmosphere, maybe not knowing many people, all that's scary. But, you know, dressing up and leaving the house is a victory. Finding somewhere to socialise is a victory. <coughs> Pardon me, you know. Walking across a crowded room and talking to someone is a victory. You know, just celebrate those small victories. And by doing that, you will start to build what you want from every aspect of your life. I think that's wonderful. We have a couple questions here for you on chat, Peter. Tattoo Tally asks, has Peter always been organized or did he have a traumatic event that changed his life? <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm asked this question so often. Um, I, I don't know why it would need to be a trauma, but <laughs> I, I can roll with that one. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of seven children. And, you know, my dad was a motor mechanic um, we grew up in a very small house. Um, neither of my parents finished eighth grade, and they put the seven of us, the seven kids, all through college. And as children, um, you know, we, we didn't have a lot, and what we had, we were taught to really treat with honor and respect. You know, we didn't have disposable income. We, you know, it, there just wasn't a lot of physical stuff when we were kids. And I think, you know, I was raised always to respect what we owned. Um, you know, there was a very strong work ethic. Um, and I think much of, you know, much of my kind of organizing bent comes from, you know, the, I guess, the principles and, and kind of the values I inherited from my mum and dad. Um, and then, I don't know, but, you know, I've always loved organizing, not organizing, you know, um, you know, constructing homes, you know, building. So there's that element, you know, I'm, you know, I've, I've had a, a lifelong interest in kind of psychology that plays into it. You know, I, I get stressed very easily. So, you know, I just need to have order around me. I'm certainly not manic about it. Um, and for me, I just, you know, I like, I like knowing where things are. I like not having a ton of stuff to worry about. I like the freedom of not having a ton of stuff. And, um, you know, I just like watching the way that you can transform people's lives by, by altering their attitude to stuff. I agree wholeheartedly with that. My organization of business is healing through organization. It was very purposeful when I named it that because I wanted to help people heal in some way. And I feel the show, that's my goal of the show too, to help people get off the couch, get moving, and, and do whatever it is that they're meant to do. Well, you know, for me, Julie, it's, it's really fascinating to me that the word organic and the word organization come from the same root. You know, and when you talk about being organic or eating organic or living a more organic lifestyle, you think of, you know, things that are, uh, are natural and whole and complete and unspoiled and fully human I mean that's that's what we think about when we think of things being organic and for me that's exactly what I think about when I think about things being organized that an organized life for me is very much about living the kind of the, you know the best life that you can in a way that's truest to your human spirit and to the things you want from, you know, from the life that you have. And, and for me, that, that, that makes it really exciting. I love that. I think that's a wonderful analogy. I hope you use that more or talk about that more. I just think I've never heard that before, and that's kind of an aha moment for me. We have another <laughs> question here for you, Peter, on chat. Brenda asks, how can I start a career as a professional organizer? Are there certifications? Yeah, there's, um, uh, I'm not sure if Brenda's here in the U.S. or in Canada. In both countries, there is um, you know, a professional accrediting body. In, in the United States, it's called the National Association of Professional Organizers, NAPO. Um, and if you, um, you can go to their website, napo.net, or you can go to my website, peterwalshdesign.com, peterwalshdesign.com, and look at the frequently asked questions section, the FAQ section, and there's a list of resources there on becoming a professional organizer and uh, links to NAPO, the NAPO website. You can um, uh, 
Uh, there's also ways that you can find organisers in your area to talk to um, and get kind of involved in, in what is a, you know, a very exciting and, um, and fun and interesting group of people. Excellent. Now we have a comment here from Jill, and I want to remind everyone, if you have a question for Peter, feel free to chat it or Skype at Computers 2K Voice or call us at 919-518-9773. Jill says, I just wanted to say that as a dietitian with a passion for meal planning, I appreciate Peter's message about always having a plan for the food you bring into your home. The small step slash goal message works perfectly for eating healthfully as well. So would you maybe talk about that a little bit, your advice yeah, about you know, meal planning? I, I, wrote, I wrote a book, and I'm not sure whether – what was, what was the, the questioner's name? Uh, Jill. I'm not sure if Jill will be so enthusiastic when she hears that I wrote a book <laughs> called Does, Does This Clutter Make My Butt Look Fat? Um, but the, the, the whole point of that book was that, um, you know, the, it was very interesting in helping people declutter their homes – you, many, many people came back to me and said, you know, once I got my home organized, I started to lose weight. I started to live a healthier lifestyle and started to lose weight. And I was just inundated with people telling me this. And so does this clutter make my butt look fat is very much about it, it, the basis is that um, by organizing your life, your home, your kitchen, the way you shop, the way you prepare meals, um, that you can really transform the way that you eat. And if you're not organized, what happens is you come home from work or run into the house and, and the, you end up very quickly going for what is the easy choice, ordering takeout or, you know, put, cooking something out of a box, something pre-packaged that, that may not be healthy. So the easy choice becomes the go-to choice. But if you are organized, if you have made sure that the stuff in your kitchen reflects the kind of meals you want, then what happens is the good choice becomes the easy choice. And you'll discover that you start eating better living a healthier way and really start moving towards the goals you have that match what you want from your body and from your, from your food and from your kitchen. And so for me, it's fairly simple and steers away entirely from the idea of, of dieting that, that just you know, makes no sense and is never successful. And Jill comments that she loves that book, so she has read it. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, Jill. I'm glad I'm off the hook. You are. And actually, I know Jill, and you're right up there with, with her, her devotion to you is right up there with mine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Audio you. has a really interesting question for you. I, I think this is great. Is the Hoarders TV show a good idea or a bad one? We stopped watching it because we felt they were not getting enough counseling for their hoarders. Yeah, I'm, I mean, to be very blunt, I'm not a fan of the, um, of the hoarding shows on TV. I mean, you know, I've worked with quite a few hoarders. Um, I, was, I did one of the very first hoarding shows on American television just over five years ago on the Oprah Winfrey show when we, we decluttered a home that was 3,200 square feet and it took eight weeks to declutter that home. You know, we had a team at times as many as 80 people on hand. Um, Dr. David Tolan was, who's a, you know, an expert in hoarding in the United States, was on call 24-7 for that show at my request. And the, the bottom line is that, that with hoarding, um, there is always a mental health component, always a, a fairly serious mental health component. And there, there, there are often times um, on the hoarding shows where the line between substance and spectacle becomes very blurred. And, um, you know, you just can't, you can't go into a home and, you know, by, by stripping all the stuff out of the home in, you know, in a couple of days, you know, expect any kind of permanent long-term change. And I think, you know, there was... Um, 
one of the shows did a revisit program last year, might have been earlier this year, late last year, where they went back to five families who had been on the show. And I, if my memory serves me correctly, without exception, or perhaps only, you know, in one case it was not, not the way it was, but I think without exception, they were all worse off than when the show had first visited. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I just don't feel, certainly in terms of what they show on television, I just don't feel that they address the mental health component anywhere near well enough. And Peter, that brings a question that I had in reading your books. You say you can never win an argument with a hoarder. So what advice do you have with someone who is living with a hoarder or someone that has a lot of clutter? Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that, that you know, it's, it's very easy when, it's very, very easy when, when you have someone who's a hoarder to focus on the stuff. And, and if you do that, what happens is that you very, very quickly end up in a power struggle. Someone has to win and someone has to lose. And you see that all the time on the hoarding shows where they start talking about the stuff and it really becomes about, you know, who can win the argument. And so with hoarding, if you want to have some serious effect with the person, you have to acknowledge the fact that often there is some serious trauma involved, you know, that the person has been through some kind of trauma that has really put them into this pattern, that the person has trouble processing information. There's a, there's a, a different way hoarders' brains function. It's been proven through MRI research that their brains function in different ways, that, that you know, they have, a, a, you know, there's an incredible emotional attachment to stuff that normal pe the people who don't have the hoarding problem simply cannot understand that they have a very strange and often um, not very highly functioning problem solving and decision making methodology that that you have to you have to really work with them at at a much more supportive level often one that families can't get involved in because there's too much kind of emotion involved to help them look at changing their patterns of behavior. You have to bring in someone who has mental health expertise to get them to start rewriting the scripts in their head, the things they keep saying over and over to themselves. Um, you know, you have to help them to look at you know, ways of kind of reformulating their, their daily patterns of collecting stuff and hoarding it. Um, you know, as tough as it is, you know, getting exasperated and angry is not going to get you anywhere. And we're all human. We're all human, and we very easily fall into all of that. Absolutely. Now, Charlie wants to know, what's the trauma that causes hoarding? Look, in my experience, it, it, it's very varied. I mean, I, I'm not, I, I, need, I just want to add very strongly, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a mental health professional. I'm just talking from anecdotal evidence. What I have found very often with hoarders is that in their past, often in their childhood, there is some trauma, whether it's loss, desertion, grief, abuse, abandonment. There is something that has happened in their early childhood. And then in many, many cases that I have seen, what happens is that a second trauma happens later in life, what I call a precipitating event that somehow triggers the hoarding behavior. And that's often something like losing a job, death of a partner, death of a child, um, divorce, empty nest syndrome. It's very interesting. And I haven't seen this studied anywhere, but I have seen this again and again, that often there is an early trauma and then what I call a precipitating event seems to spark this hoarding behavior as a reaction to that precipitating event. But so much of it seems to tie back to an early childhood trauma. The, the, hoarding, the whole hoarding behavior is only 
beginning to be studied and understood. You know, for a long time, it was considered kind of, you know, a subset of OCD. And um, that certainly is not the case. Um, you know, and David Tolan um, and, and others of his ilk, Randy Frost also is another expert in this area. Um, they're, they're doing a lot of work in this. And if people, if your listeners are interested, David, David Tolan's book called Buried in Treasures, is an incredible kind of hoarding 101 book that really gives great insight into hoarding behavior and really helps people who have hoarders in their lives look at ways and, uh, and strategies for dealing with them. Buried in Treasures by David Tolan. Excellent. Thanks for that book recommendation. Hockey player wants to know, what can you say about spirituality and organizing? And I know one of your books, this is one of my favorite things you've ever written, Clutter Takes Us Out of the Present. So if you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, you know, for me, um, I, I'm not a religious person at all. And, um, you know, but I, I consider myself a fairly spiritual person. And, and, and for me, the basis of spirituality comes back to, you know, kind of a, a stillness and a focus and a you know, and in what I would call an interior life, you know, the ability to, to settle and, be, and be, be calm at one's core. And I just don't believe that that is possible in a cluttered, messy, disorganized environment. I just don't think it's possible. You know, I, in fact, I, I'm sure it's not possible that if you open the front door of your house, and the first thing you think is, oh, hell, look at the mess the kids have made. Or if you walk into your kitchen and you think, oh, you know, I, you know there's so much stuff in here. Where am I going to start? Or you, you sit at your desk and you think, oh, God, look at this paper. How am I ever going to get it filed? If that's your reaction to your living space, one of exasperation and frustration, one of feeling overwhelmed or paralyzed, there's no way you can have a rich spiritual or interior life. It just can't happen. So for me, you know, the, the ability to live, you know, a calm, peaceful, focused, motivated interior life or spiritual life, whatever you want to label it, I think is tied very intimately to the physical environment you which, in which you live. And I, I would even go so far as to say, you know, our physical spaces reflect our interior realities. I love that. I agree with that completely. Now, in our advertising um, society, and you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, a product that's going to guarantee us to be skinny or more beautiful, how yeah. can we help determine a want versus a need? Because I think a lot of people get confused on that. Um. Keep asking a question. I'm not sure what you mean. Keep going with that. So how can someone determine, you know, wanting something versus really needing it? Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, for, for me it comes back to, and I, I'm, I sound like a broken record on this, but I keep coming back to what do you want from your life? And, you know, if, if, if it were... You know, let, let's say let, let's say you're looking at stuff that you could buy for your master bedroom. Let's just make it really practical, and we want to determine whether something you're looking at is a want or a need. Let me ask you: give me three or four words for you that describe what you want from a perfect master bedroom for you. What do you want to feel, experience, um, you know, sense when you step into a perfect master bedroom? Well, one of the things I can say on air is peace. Okay, well, you can say a lot of things on air. You know, it could be <laughs> sexy, romantic, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, generally when you think of a master bedroom, you think of haven, sanctuary, getaway, kid-free space, relaxing, intimate, you know, the mm -hmm. list is long. Then, again, that's the list you hold in your head. Then when you're looking at something, you pick up, you know, I don't know, you know, whatever, you know, a, you know, a framed poster of, of Kiss from the 80s, and mm -hmm. you think, you know, will this poster create a sense of calm and intimacy and relaxation in my master bedroom? The answer is pretty obvious pretty quickly. And I think that 
by having a very clear sense of what you want from your physical spaces and then using the question, will this object help me create that? Will this object move me closer to or farther away from the vision that I have for this room or this space? I think that helps fairly quickly determine whether something's just, you know, um, you know, kind of a, a flash in the pan want or something that you really need in the sense of something that will help you create the space that will make you happier, you know, more fully the person you want to be. Now, Brenda wants to know, because you're also a design expert, are there certain colors that we should have in our home or workspace? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not really the guy to ask that question of, to be quite honest. You know, I, for me, for me, it's very much about that. That's such a personal, it's such a personal choice. You know, um, you know, for me at the moment, oranges are the color. You know, orange is the color that for me is really the motivating challenging, exciting kind of colour that I, you know, I'm surrounding myself with. And, and I don't know why it feels vibrant, it feels exciting, it feels motivating to me. And so, you know, in my office, I'm, look, I'm sitting in my office right now, you know, all the file boxes in my office are bright orange. The rug in my office is orange. You know, some of the accessories in my office, not that there are many, are orange. Um, but for me, it comes back to, you know, grab, grab um, magazines and rip out pages that speak that have colours that speak to you and and make you know elicit some kind of emotional response from you, and then reproduce that in your own home, in your own living space, in your own life, um, until you find colours that that kind of resonate and work for you. I, you know, I, I I'm not the guy who would prescribe any any particular color in a, in a kind of a feng shui kind of way. Now, since it's holiday time, Peter, we've got Thanksgiving next week and Hanukkah and Christmas coming up. Any holiday tips that you'd like to share? <laughs> um, don't go crazy. You know, don't go crazy. I mean, for, for me, it comes back to, you know, in in two years or five years or ten years time, very few of us remember the gifts that we got, but we remember the way we felt or the experiences that we had. And, you know, don't confuse the value of a gift with the quantity of love that someone has for you or that you should have for someone else. And so, you know, to distill that, you know, maybe this is the year that that we should all be looking at, you know, buying, investing, creating experiences for those we love. You know, a day of yard work as a gift, an offer to clean all the windows in someone's home, an offer to take the kids to the zoo or, you know, to a concert instead of more stuff that's easy to buy without much thought and will be forgotten in a minute. I love that. Now, my other question for you is, what advice would you have for busy families? Like my brother and sister-in-law, they both are small business owners. She's doing an independent film, and they have a seven-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old. So um, life is crazy. Me, okay. What, what's, ask me a specific question. Well, so for someone who's two busy families or a busy family life, what one step would you say they could do to start decluttering or getting organized if there just doesn't seem to be any time in the day? And I think it's more of a okay. challenge for... Yeah. It, it's, uh, there's a premise there that I don't subscribe to, that there's not enough time in the day. You give time to what you believe is important. And so, you know, I think for, for young couples, for families, you know, for parents especially, you know, the most important thing is to realize that in a family your relationship comes before the kids. And I think that that's something that is absolutely taboo to many people's ears. You know, kids come first, kids come first. I think that's insane. But it's really important for, for parents especially, a couple in a relationship especially, to check in with each other regularly 
and ask ourselves, are the things we do, we're doing creating the kind of kids we want, the kind of home we want, the kind of family we want, the kind of experience that we want our kids to remember? That's what's important. Great advice, hopefully, since it comes and, from and, you. And, and, and you should ask, and the one thing you can do that will transform a relationship is the last question you should ask each other at night before you go to sleep is, is there anything I could have done differently for you today? Try that and see what happens to your family life. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that. Now, Peter, there are a couple, two questions I like to ask all guests at the end of the show. And the first is, what advice would you have for someone struggling out there? Maybe they're going through divorce, lost a job, and just a really challenging time in their life. What would you say to them? Um, I think it's really easy to give kind of a trite answer to that kind of a question. I mean, you know, I, I think everyone, I think all of us are frail, are frail people. And I think that that, that you know the one the one thing that I would say is that by sharing a burden that you have, whether it's about a relationship or a job or just a worry, by sharing that with someone, it can make a massive difference to the kind of load that you are carrying. So I guess I'd say you know don't don't bear that burden, whatever it is, you know alone. I think that 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 for me is something that. That, that I you know constantly remind myself about if there's a problem share it with someone because it makes it a lot easier and I'm all about getting off the couch I one of the passions about doing this show is for people to transform their lives so what one step can people take right after the show tonight or tomorrow morning to reawaken their brilliance find five things in your home that you haven't used in in 12 months put them in a box and take them to goodwill tomorrow Outstanding. That's easy. That can be done in 10 minutes. Okay, that's all you need to do. Start today. Five things. And Peter, how can people find out more information about you? And do you have any books coming out? Are you going to be on TV? Anything that you'd like to share? Um, I'm, I'm now a regular guest on the Rachel Ray Show, so you can catch me there. Um, you can um, check out my website, peterwalshdesign.com, and uh, follow me on Facebook. That's kind of uh, the funnest thing that I'm doing at the moment where anything that's going on and um, lots of craziness um, is tracked there. I answer, you know, all, all questions that are posed there. I check it pretty regularly. So follow me just at uh, facebook.com slash Peter Walsh. Excellent. And then, uh, Peter, I'm going to hold up my favorite book of yours. If you have, if you could sum it up, lighten up, love what you have, have what you need, be happier with less. I think this is outstanding. But what advice from this book would you have for everyone? That the, the choices that you make help you create the life that you want. And every single choice, whether it's a word you say, a thing you buy, you know, an action you take, everything, every single thing you do moves you either closer to or farther away from the life that you want. And that's a choice you have every day. Excellent. I truly believe that we do. We have a choice every single moment of the day. We make a choice. Clear some clutter to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire. Are you looking for information on how to get organized and reduce clutter? Have you wanted to hire a professional organizer, but it's not in your budget? Do you just need some quick professional advice on clutter or organization? Our Clutter-free living classes and how to organize your life office hours support you in becoming free, moving forward, and achieving success. Learn more at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. Thanks for tuning in to Clearing the Clutter Inside and Out. Sign up for our newsletter and receive a free copy of 10 Clutter-Free Living Tips. Ready to create the life you choose, deserve, and desire? Learn about Julie's coaching, ebooks, online monthly decluttering classes, how to organize your life, office hours, and her unique clutter free living mastermind at reawakenyourbrilliance.com. You can also watch all episodes on YouTube or download on iTunes and more. 
Join us next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Remember, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step.